Bename Chodavande Rangin Kama, in the name of the God of Rainbows. His name was Kion Pierfalak. He was nine years old. He could often be found creating inventions, building contraptions, and testing experiments. He dreamt of being an inventor. His mother and father would often film his experiments, many of which he began with, in the name of the God of Rainbows. His dream was stripped away from him on November 16th, when Islamic regime security forces fired bullets at the car that was carrying him, his mother, and his father. Kion, the sweet young boy, was shot in the heart and killed immediately. He is the youngest known victim of this revolution. May his memory be blessed and a blessing. Her name was Nika Shah Karami. She was 16 years old. She dreamt of becoming a singer. On September 20th, Nika was abducted by the Islamic regime while participating in a protest in the Iranian capital of Tehran. The death certificate issued by the regime states that she died several hours later. The cause of death was injuries sustained after being hit numerous times by a large, heavy object. Her family was informed of her death 10 days later. They wanted nothing more than to be able to lay Nika to rest in her hometown of Khormabad, but the regime didn't even give them that. Nika's body was, again, stolen by the regime, and she was buried in another location so as to prevent any further protests in relation to her death. May her memory be blessed and a blessing. And last, but certainly not least, her name was Masa Gina Amini. She was 22 years old. She had just been admitted to university and aspired to become a lawyer. On September 13th, Masa traveled to, with her family to Tehran to visit her brother. Upon their arrival, Masa was arrested by the so-called morality police for indecent exposure. They claimed her hijab wasn't worn properly and her ankles were exposed. The police told her brother they would take her to a detention center to undergo a briefing case and that she would be released within an hour. Two hours after her arrest, she was transported to a hospital. After two days in a coma, Massa died due to injuries sustained during her time in the detention center. Her memory is blessed, and by her death, she gave life to this revolution. Tonight, we are here for Kion, we are here for Nika, and we are most certainly here for Massa. But we are also here for the countless Iranians whose names, faces, and stories we do not and may never know. Good evening. My name is Ariel Yael Mokhtarzadeh. I'm co-president of 30 Years After, and on behalf of the host committee and all our hosting organizations, I am honored to welcome you all to Baraya Iran. Social media is a critical tool in this movement. So tonight, we encourage you to take photos, film videos, and post on social media. Let our Iranian brothers and sisters know that we're here for them. 43 years ago, many in this room and our families were forced to flee a country they had called home for generations to escape a violent revolution, unimaginable persecution, and second-class status. 43 years later, for the last 79 days, women, girls, and people across Iran have risked life, livelihood, and limb to fight, literally and figuratively, for Zan, women, Zendegi, life, and Azadi, freedom. In the last 79 days, the Islamic Republic has killed over 462 Iranians, 64 of them children, and they have arrested 18,206 protesters, many of them women who have been raped, tortured, and abused in some of Iran's worst prisons. With your permission, I'd like to finish with a personal story. For as long as I can remember, love of Iran has been embedded in my DNA. 
I grew up seeing just as many photos of the Pahlavi family around my grandmother's home as there were photos of her grandchildren. I grew up hearing stories of evening strolls down Khiabuna Pahlavi, early morning swims at Estagra Soraya, and annual summer vacations to Shomal. I was always struck that despite the very traumatic, sudden, violent way in which our families were forced to flee from Iran, that the bitter taste of that expulsion in no way tainted the deep-rooted love of generations. So much so that it was instilled in and inherited by a generation that until now could never even dream of visiting Iran. That generation is my generation. It's the generation of many of us in this room. Perhaps more so than my parents or grandparents, I felt a negative feeling toward Iran, its government, and all it represented in my family and our people's history. But then I learned about Massa, Nika, and Kion. Then I heard the chants of Zan Zendegi Azadi. And then I understood that those brave individuals fighting to free Iran aren't just fighting for themselves. They're fighting for those who, have, who never had a chance 43 years ago, and they're fighting for you and me too. This revolution represents one of the most pivotal moments of our modern era. This is the first women-led, Gen Z-fueled revolution of our time. But more importantly than that, it matters because it, because it is our revolution. The people of Iran are risking everything for a chance to reclaim their country, to have the opportunity to be the deciders of their own fates. The least we can do is show up and amplify their voices. To those of you who have taken to the internet as the brave people of Iran have taken to the streets, we say thank you. To those of you who have mobilized your families and friends to show up at local protests in your communities as the courageous people of Iran are arrested and jailed, sometimes indefinitely, for doing the same, we say, thank you. To those of you who are exercising your democratic rights, the freedoms of speech, press, and assembly to fight for the hope that someday our Iranian sisters and brothers might be able to do the same, we say, thank you. And to those of you who perhaps have not done so yet, we say, welcome. We hope that this evening provides you with the fuel, the facts, and the practical next steps that we all need to continue to do our part. Baraya Iran. One of my favorite Persian words is hamsaya, which translates to neighbor. If you break it down into its two core parts, ham, same, and saya, shade, you get a fuller picture. A neighbor is not just someone you share physical space with. It's someone who stands with you and stands by you when you need it most. We are lucky to have many of you in this room. Now it is my pleasure to welcome a dear Hamsaya of our community to the stage, Rabbi Noah Farkas, CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. Can we give Ariel another round of applause? Thank you for your courage, your kindness, and your bravery. And I want to also make sure that we give a round of applause to all of the partnering organizations that you'll see up on the slides. This is what it means to come together as a community. I'm Rabbi Noah Farkas. I am the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. And uh, as the only gringo on the stage, it is wonderful and I am humbled to be here with all of you. I want to just share just a word with you before we bring out our panel. Solidarity is a word that many of us throw around in um, just in casual conversation. To have solidarity means to live with an open and with a global heart. It means, at least in the Jewish context, that there are people in this world that we have never met, but people that we know. We know their story. We know what it's like as a Jewish community to feel oppressed. Those stories exist in our history, in our families. We know 
what it's like to live in a society that prevents us from living our fullest lives. We know what it's like to have to run in the middle of the night for safety and security. That is what it means to live with a global and open heart, is to live in a community with people that you've never met, but whose stories you know. In just a couple of days, Jewish community globally celebrates the holiday of Hanukkah, which is a story of revolution. It's a story when, under an ever more repressive regime, a small group of individuals decided that they had enough. They had had enough of being prevented of living the life they wanted to live. They had enough of being prevented from studying Torah or naming their children. They had enough of being isolated and oppressed and dispossessed. And they decided to do something about it. And the reason why that story makes it into our canon is because the revolution worked. And it worked because they made the decision to overcome the distance between how the world was presenting itself to these Maccabees and how they wanted to live. That heroic revolutionary decision is of biblical proportions. And for the last 79 days, we have seen this community in Iran make the same decision. To look at the world, to look at the world in which they live, to look at the country that they love so much and say the way the world is, the way this country is, is not the way it should be. And that they themselves have taken to the streets and they themselves have taken to social media and they themselves have organized global protests. They themselves have put their necks on the line and have paid the highest price because they made the decision to live a better life for themselves. That kind of courage, that kind of bravery, that kind of focus is the most inspiring thing in the world that rises to the level of being told in tales and legends in generations to come. The second story about Hanukkah and the oil that lasted for eight days, the one that's in the Talmud, the one that we tell our children, the one that says the miracle is not just in the revolution, but is in this little thing that just extended for eight days. That story is a lovely story. That story talks about, more than anything else, the coming together of a community to rebuild the temple after the revolution. They needed the oil for eight days because they needed to get together to produce enough oil for the following week. The story of Hanukkah is not just about revolution, but it is about building together. And this community, by coming together with all of these different organizations, by coming together in this room, at this place, and by taking responsibility for each other is itself a miracle. Because what that means is that we can stand with our friends and with our neighbors in Iran, we can stand and stand up for our values here in America, and we can stand for Jewish solidarity, having that global heart, understanding that there are people out there that we love even if we've never met them. And so thank you for being here tonight, because being here tonight means you are helping to make the revolutionary choice, the miraculous choice, of being together, of building something together, of standing up for our values, and helping to give strength and solidarity to the people who need it in this very critical moment, in this very critical hour. So thank you so much for being here. On behalf of the Federation, the organization that takes responsibility for the Jewish community, it's my pleasure to have this panel tonight. And to that effect, I want to introduce to you an amazing rabbi, Rabbi Tarlin Rabizadeh, who is here tonight, who will lead us in the panel. Hello, everyone. Hey. 
Welcome everyone. Salam alaikum. Shalom alechem. Durud bar hamegi. I am Rabbi Tarlin Rabizre, the American Jewish University's Vice President for Jewish Engagement. And on behalf of all of us at AJU, I want to extend a very warm welcome. We are so thrilled that you chose to take time out of your Sunday. And we were all talking about how it's rainy today. And so we know LA drivers don't always leave their house on, uh, on a rainy day. So, so thank you. And thank you for joining us on this important evening as we come together to learn and to show up in solidarity with the Iranian women and the Iranian people in their fight for a total regime change and in what they are now asking us to refer to as a full-fledged revolution, which started, as you heard from Ariel this earlier, um, with the death of Masajina Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman who was beaten to death by the morality police, or rather, I should say she was murdered. The Iranian people, after that, took quickly to the streets in outrage. They were fed up with this regime that has taken up for the last 43 years. They began burning their hijab, their head covering, large bonfires in the public street and demonstration, dancing and singing in the streets as an act of protest, since singing and dancing and letting your hair flow freely is illegal. And it has been illegal since 1979, when this tyrannical regime took over. And for many of us Iranians in the diaspora, we have been waking up daily to social media posts of videos, tweets, photos, capturing the horrendous day by day of an unarmed people being beaten, shot at, and killed by merciless men in official uniform. We witnessed scenes upon scenes of students at university surrounded, arrested, beaten, and killed women dragged by their hair in broad daylight, merely for advocating for basic human rights. More and more, testimonials are coming out every day of rape from inside the prison, rape against both women and men. What does this revolution mean? How is this uprising different from past attempts? What should we and what can we in the diaspora do to help their cause? These are some of the questions that we're gonna try and address tonight. I will just say one thing. To those of you who might not be aware firsthand, which is something that you should know, your Iranian and Iranian-American brothers and sisters, many of whom are in this room right now, it has been extremely hard to stomach what has been going on on the daily. Please know that those of us who are first-generation Americans always heard stories of what happened in that 1979 revolution and its aftermath that caused our families to flee their homeland. But now, with cameras capturing everything, minute by minute updates, we are not only watching our grandparents and parents relive their own traumas, but we ourselves now understand the painful truth in a new light for the first time. And so I want to empower all of you with an important Jewish task, which is to always ask questions. Ask questions of your leaders. Ask questions of your biblical teachings and religion, whatever that religion may be. Ask questions of the news media that seems to not always get it right. And no, the morality police has not been dismantled, by the way, that's fake news. But more importantly, ask questions about what is happening to the Iranian people. Ask us how we are doing. Ask us, what can we do to help? Tonight, we are asking to qu questions together and we came together as a coalition because we needed to lean on each other during this time of pain and confusion as we watch our Iranian people fight for basic human rights from afar. I wanna take a minute now to thank all of our organizers. If you can please all stand up. I hope to cover all of your names. Matthew Nuriel of Jemena, let's go. <laughs> Ariel Mokhtarzadeh. Jasmine Yudin, Jason Yudin, Jasmine Nico Hakimi, Hayes is Joel Goldman, Elnit Siamak Kordestani, Daniel Brawl, Progressive Zionists of California, Tara Khoshbin, Tara Koshbin, Chaya Community, Mary Kochav and Jason Lievenberg of the Jewish Federation of Greater LA, and of course. Chelsea Khakshuri Larian, who wasn't able to be with us today. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for the evening. Valley Bet Shalom. <laughs> Stephen Wise, my alma mater. Sinai Temple, Jemena, 
30 years after Chelsea and Jason Larian for their personal contribution, the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles, Iranian American Federation, the Anti-Defamation League, and of course, AJU. And I, and I wanna just take a moment to thank our president, Dr. Jeffrey Herbst, um, who when I asked him whether I should pull this event together, it was maybe uh, two weeks into the job working here, and he said, no problem without a question. So I, I really wanna say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Our event tonight is called Baroye Iran, for I or because of Iran. It is based on a beautiful song written by Shervin Hajipur, who compiled the lyrics from tweets, messages, collected from the Iranian people. It tells a story of the litany of reasons, the baroye, the what, the why people are fighting. And the song has become an anthem for the protest, this uprising, this call for a total I want to take a moment to give a brief uh, introduction of our, each of our panelists. Alika Laban is a British-born Iranian, now American, attorney, um, dealing with mostly criminal and human rights and social media content creator, currently focusing advocacy on the Iranian revolution. If you aren't following Alika, you should be. Dr. Human Sashar is an independent scholar, a consulting editor, and a contributing author of the Encyclopedia Iranica, as well as a contributing author to the Encyclopedia of Jews in the Islamic World. Some of you might have the following book on your shelves, Esther's Children, edited by Dr. Sashar. Welcome. Moj Mahdara, killing it, killing it on the news is currently a managing partner of Kinship Ventures, a partner of Intuition Capital, and an avid investor and entrepreneur. Matara is also a co-founder of beautyunited.org and a founding member of the United Diaspora Collective. Please follow the Iranian, sorry, Diaspora Collective on your social media. Please welcome. So I was going to start differently, but now seeing such an emotional, emotional song, I wanted to know if, um, if all of you could just take a minute briefly to talk a little bit about 
the protests and how they've affected you personally. And you can take it any which way you want. I just ask that we try to keep it brief. Whoever wants to start. Uh, this is a difficult question because it requires kind of uh, elaborated answer, but I think um, the way that the protest, I guess now revolution has affected me is that I think that there is a very, this is kind of like a unique situation in that us in the diaspora are people who we know could have or should have been in Iran. A lot of us are not there because of some stroke of luck, right? So seeing that happening every day, seeing that happening in the streets, it's almost like that could have been us. And this is why we say that we are massage, you know, Amini, right? So we are having to deal with this kind of bittersweet experience of, um, you know, the grief of what they're going through, and then almost like a sense of weird relief that it's not happening to you, but then guilt of even having that relief. So there's so many complicated emotions of guilt um, that go behind, you know, uh, having to and wanting to support that. And so it's almost like it, it makes you feel as though in order to compensate for the fact that you're not there, you're having to kind of indulge in this level of suffering to counteract that feeling of guilt, right? So you're like, I feel like I have to suffer. It's my responsibility to suffer, which can be quite toxic in a way and very harmful. So it's um, kind of balancing that tension of not, you know, indulging in this kind of like violence porn to make you, to make you, to compensate for the fact that you're not experiencing it, right? But that has a terrible effect on your mental health. So it's like you're, you're learning to navigate this extremely complicated emotion as, as a person in the diaspora while trying to remain like to a degree detached enough in order to keep the activism going on this side. For me, it's been a, a kind of a throwback to the 90s when I went to New York and joined ACT UP. Um, I, I feel like my community of friends who've been suffering from a horrible disease that is killing them and killing their creativity have finally received news that there's medication that's going to cure them. So I stay up all night, I cry all night, I cry about the people who are, that we're losing. I, I'm losing my mind about the killing of children and I cannot, I'm shocked by the ability of many of my countrymen who claim to be messengers of God, who claim to be wanting to bring a godly world to Iran, even as they're killing 10-year-old, 8-year-old, 9-year-old children, uh, even as they're raping 15, 16-year-old girls because of some psychotic belief that virgins will go to heaven as a matter of course if they die, so they have to rape them so that they make sure that they don't end up in heaven. Um, but at the end of it all, I am extremely hopeful. I feel like I've been waiting on the sidelines for 44 years to be able to go back to something that was taken away from me. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, listen, I've been telling all of my friends I'm going to Shiraz for aid, so, and that, that's the Iranian New Year, March 21st, so. First of all, I just wanna say, um, this event in some ways feels a little bit like a dream come true for me. When, um, when, uh, when I first learned about Massa Gina Amini's death, uh, we have a friend in common, Nicolette, and we were talking about it was going to take an intersectional movement to move this horrific crime against humanity into focus. Um, it does not surprise me that this crisis has brought forward people who are uh, queer, gay, uh, interfaith, Jewish, Baha'i, uh, Muslim, uh, for so many people who have been exiled from their country to imagine that you have no home, 
You have nowhere to claim. You've been lying to everyone saying you're Persian when you're really Iranian because you want no association to the Islamic Republic. And there is, um, my wife and I spend most of our evenings because she is a scholar and academic and PhD and she got a PhD with Angela Davis and she's a smart informed person and I have a nonprofit around diversity and inclusion. How could we not know that people were being killed and raped and tortured systematically like at scale when we learned that the Islamic Republic was leading on a per capita basis on mass execution, we spend most of our evenings feeling like, were we stupid? How could we have not known? And so this revolution, this inqalab, has brought forward the ability to see into a massive, massive crime against humanity. And it is difficult to do anything else but inqalab all day long on the internet because you know that you can get exposure and attention and these poor souls are out there dying in the streets and they're kids. And so it's difficult to do anything else right now but Magbar Jumun al like literally. For those of you who don't speak Farsi, Engalab means revolution, so every day Engalab and Magba, you know, death to the to this uh, horrible regime. All of them. All of them. Khamenei. All of them. One by one. Amen. <laughs> um, so you, you brought something up, and I heard you all talk about it in the background. So before I get to my script, let's just, uh, are we Persian? I mean, I, you, got, you know, what do I say anymore? I mean, what, am I Persian? No. no. So um, I'm, I'm going to jump in because there's a, there's a historical answer to your question. And the, the historical answer to your question is that we're all Iranian. The land known today as Iran, uh, e uh, when it was founded by Cyrus the Great 2,600 years ago, throughout its history, regardless of where the boundaries moved, which at some point was all the way to, from the Mediterranean Sea to the borders of India, has always in Persian, the language of Iranians, been known as Iran. However, it has been known in the West as Persia because it is uh, a, a trade the same way, you know, on the news you hear, well, you know, the White House said, or the news from Washington is, the, the um, province in Iran, in the center of south, southern south of Iran, uh, known as Fars, in Persian Pars, before it got Arabicized into Fars, um, was the seat of the capital. So all Western nations, because of the Greek historians and all of that, started to refer to Iran as Persia. Mm -hmm. In 1935, the Reza Shah Pahlavi, the founder of the Pahlavi dynasty and the father of the last Shah of Iran, uh, who was an arch nationalist um, and therefore had some Nazi sympathies, was um, manipulated by Nazi propaganda because of the association of Iran with Aryan and all of that sort of stuff and because of his own national fervor and his desire to disassociate his own crown with the previous Qajar dynasty who had basically pillaged Iran uh, into provitude, um, came to the United Nations and demanded of the world that henceforth you will refer to our country as Iran. Uh, unfortunately, this created a semantic problem. Everyone has known Iran as Persia, the language is Persian, the rugs are Persian, the <laughs> golf is Persian, the cats are Persian. Um, the women are Persian. The, the, you know, Hafez, Saadi, Khayyam, all of these are Persian poets. So it created a break uh, in a, a branding crisis. Uh, but what has remained is, the, the country is Iran, everything associated with it culturally is Persian, including our language. It's not Farsi, because Farsi is Persian for Persian. Um, and um, yeah, and, but, but there are, it's a, it's a very emotional world, and um, Mosh can talk about you know, some of the emotional aspects of why people uh, choose one rather than the other. Sure. Um, we were talking earlier backstage that when I was uh, in second or third grade, my dad would say, when you go to school, you make sure you tell everyone you're Persian mm -hmm. because it's not safe for you to say you're Iranian. Uh, it's in the middle of the hostage crisis. 
and the American public, fairly so, we're still, I mean, not even Stowe, like we're all still recovering from that very vivid media that was horrific. I mean, look at this guy. He's like, you know, Khomeini comes so, out. So your dad saw a distinction. My dad literally would say to us, just tell them you're Persian. You don't need to say Iranian. Because if you say Iranian, yes. it will, you, will, you will be picked on. It will create violence for you. You know, people will not want to be your friend. So I remember very early on, I mean, I think up until September 20th of this year, it said on my Instagram, Persian. Mm. And uh, I have deep feelings about that now that I'm processing all the time. Like this living so many years of my life through the lens of trying to sort of blend in to throw off the 43 years of shame of, I mean, it's difficult to not be ashamed of it. So um, this is an amazing opportunity in this weird way because we all get a chance to stand up and say like, no, we like actually, it is the Iran versus the Islamic Republic. And I, from the moment I've seen that, it has resonated so deeply, I think, not just for Iranians, but for everyone around the world uh, who, who rejects completely the Islamic Republic and their value system. Very interesting. I was always taught not to say I'm Iranian because I've never been there and it's not my nationality, but I associate myself with the culture. You, you live and learn. So I am, in fact, Iranian. All right. <laughs> All right. Dr. Sashar, I mean, to the best of your ability, can you give the audience a little bit of background information on the current regime, as in who are they and how do they get here and maybe also what do they stand for? Because the next question is going to be a little bit about what life is like there. Um, a very brief history. That what, what is currently going on in Iran is not a 79-day-old story or a 43-year-old story. It is, in fact, a 170-year-old story. It started in the 1850s with Iran's encounter with the West and the, the beginnings of modernism in Iran. Uh, until the, the last dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty, the mullahs had a tremendous power in Iran. They were the only judges, they were the only teachers, they settled all sorts of family matters and everything, so they carried a lot of power and they, they had a position in government. When Iranians started to encounter the West, they started to feel embarrassed about how backwards Iran was and they associated this backwardism with Islam. And this began a movement of modernizing Iran in the late 1900s. In 1906, Iran was the first country in the Middle East to have a constitutional revolution that was meant to get rid of the Shah. But the only way that constitutional, the, the constitutionalists came to realize very quickly that the only way it would succeed would be if they brought on the clergy to um, agree to constitution because they didn't want a constitution because the constitution was going to establish laws that were often not in agreement with Shiite jurisprudence. So they, they, they brought the clergy on, they allowed them to join the parliament in order for the clergy to start advocating for a constitutional revolution that happened. That constitutional revolution kind of failed because it was supposed to be a parliamentary constitutional revolution. The Shah's father, Reza Shah, in 1925 was elected the new king by the Iranian parliament because the previous Qajar dynasty was just de depleting Iran and destroying it. In 1951, Mossadegh, many of you know him, or do you know the story of the CIA-led coup in Iran, uh, was the prime minister of Iran who actually confronted the Shah and said, listen, Iran is a parliamentary uh, uh, monarchy, so you are just a symbol of monarchy and you have nothing to do with government. I'm the one who's supposed to rule. He started to nationalize the oil. He succeeded in nationalizing Iran's oil industry, but because of the value that Iranian oil had to the US and, and England, they got rid of him. The Shah kind of took power 
And this battle that had started in 1850s kind of kept going on. The mullahs were constantly telling people that, you know, a westernized Iran is taking your daughters away, your wives are going to be prostitutes, and blah, blah, blah. Look, everyone's wearing mini skirts and makeup, and this is a <laughs> blasphemy. We can't allow for this to happen. And many of the Iranian intellectuals started to go under the guise of an Islamic discourse in order to be able to advance their ideological beliefs because the Shah was a believing Muslim and he had basically given orders that you leave the mosques alone. So that area was one of the only places in Iran where people could have revolutionary activity. When the, so, and then in 1978, there was turmoil in February of 79, the Shah left, Khomeini came back, and for about a year and a half, Iran was actually not such a bad place. All of the old intellectuals who had been part of the system got together, they rewrote a constitution for Iran, the new constitution of Iran, which in fact is one of the strongest constitutions that is out there legally in terms of human rights, except the clergy insisted that you need to add an article in there, Article 4, that gives the, um, the Council of Guardians, 12 Shiite clergymen, the power to overrule anything in law that doesn't jive with Islam. So, and then the head of that, the Revolutionary Guard, which was Khomeini and now is Khomeini, has line item veto over every single rule, in, uh, law in Iran. When the, all of this was going on, and then the, unfortunately the hostage crisis happened. When the hostage crisis happened, nobody knew who these students were who had taken the hostages. The governors, the, the people in government at that time went to Khomeini and said, listen, these people are saying that they're your followers. Tell them to stand down. We don't want to fight with the West. We don't want to fight with the United States. Khomeini noticed an opportunity. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. The entire cabinet, the magistrate, all the parliament, everybody said, listen, if you don't do this, we will resign. Iranians have since learned you don't pull a bluff on a mullah because he will stand, f f f he will hold his line, and that's what happened. They all resigned, Khomeini came in. When we tell you that the Iranian revolution, the second revolution, was hijacked by the clergy, this is what happened. Khomeini came in, he put in a bunch of other clergymen to rule, and they hijacked the government. And for the last 43 years, people have been trying to figure out a way to deal with these people, to do something about it. It's gotten worse and worse, and now we're here today. That was 150 years of history in two minutes. Dr. Sashar is often busy with, with, with all of his kids, and all I want to do is just sit and listen to all, all of this history that I want to just drink up. Um, thank you. Moj, the question that we've collected from the audience as well is, could you sort of explain a little bit about the Iran protests and how the uprisings came about? You know, I'm, I know we talked a, a, a bit about Masa Jina Amini, but also sort of helping us understand maybe what life is like for women on a day-to-day -day and also minority groups, um, just for all of our audience to sort of... Sure. Um, well, uh, Mahsa's Kurdish. She uh, had to rename herself uh, to, so she could go to school because she could not go to school with her given name. Um, I think it's important to note that this is not just an 80-day long protest. This is something that's been in the works now. I think we all know of the Green Movement. Uh, we know uh, that there was an uprising again in 2019. Uh, this is something that has been uh, sort of, it's, it's, been, it's been teetering on the edge of this now for, um, I want to say, 13. 13 years, right? I, it doesn't shock me that after COVID, uh, financial hardship, look, the Islamic Republic is a failed state, right? You've got, you know, inflation through the roof, unemployment through the roof. You've got people who are in generally just frustrated and unhappy, and they are dealing with a government that has no pause to commit any and all crimes while they have all become, ex I mean, it's rumored that Khamenei is worth something to the tune of like 80 billion bucks. Oh. 
right? Very wealthy. These people are extremely, they are living very nice lives. They travel to Canada. They buy what they want. They do what they want. That's their lives. The way that women are experiencing life in Iran is they have, no, they have half the rights of a man, you know, whether it's going to a soccer game or dancing or agency over their bodies or their career decisions or who they want to marry. Um, my cousin had married someone and the marriage was not successful, like Mary, many marriages. This person was able to withhold her passport for eight years, prevent her. She's a U.S. citizen, right? This is a U.S. citizen stuck, can't get out because their husband has the right to hold a passport and to get the divorce. The family finally had to pay him off because he had the ability to oppose this decision. Yeah. So I'm giving it to you just in plain everyday language. But I think the most important thing is as someone who has been held overnight by the Bastige. No. Yes. Yes. I went there for my uncle's wedding. I was, you know, 16, 17 at the time. And, you know, we were driving around getting an ice cream on a Friday night and we were pulled over. My sister and I were in the car with two cousins and they were able to call us, you know, whores and sluts and American this and American that and hold us, you know, I think they took us at 11 and released us the next morning at 8 a.m. That, that means I saw rifles, guns, they shot, you know, like bullets into the air to terrify you. My sister, you know, uh, made her pants dirty. It was awful. This is, this, is, this is tiny, 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 tiny experience to what the people on the streets of Iran, and I think, again, the reason we're all sitting here, we've all taken time out of our lives to do the, this 24-7 is these people are just dying. 62 children have died. 400 plus people have died that we know of. 18,000 people are, have been arrested or, and detained right now. What's going to happen to them if we don't find a way to create some sort of pressure for these people? We're definitely going to get into what we can do, but Alika, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that as well. Um, just from an outsider's perspective, people who are looking into Iran right now and they don't have a whole lot of understanding about what's going on, I think uh, a good analogy that I like to use with the Masajina Amini situation is kind of like what happened here with George Floyd, where, you know, from if you were an outsider and you had no idea what was going on, you look at that situation and you're like, one man died, what's the big deal, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not that one man died, it's that... A, there's a 250 years old century, 250 year century years <laughs> behind that that was building up, which fomented the um, mass protests that happened after George Floyd. And so in Iran, this situation with Massa Gina Amini, it was not just about Massa Gina Amini, it was not just about the headscarf, it was about what did that headscarf stand for? What did Massa Gina Amini stand for, right? It stood for you know, these 43 years of oppression that had driven women, well, everyone, but particularly women into this situation where they had nothing left to live for. And so now they are pouring into the streets because they have something to die for, right? Because when you take everything from someone, when you take away their liberty, their freedom, their right to practice their religion, their freedom of speech, the right to dance in the streets, the right to sing, what do you have to live for? So when you have nothing to live for, you have everything to die for. And that's why when people say, when they remark about Iranian women, they're like, wow, these women have no fear. It's not that they have no fear. It's that there's something bigger than fear now. You know, there's that saying, feel the fear and do it anyway. That's, their, that's where they're at right now, right? Like the fear is here, but the empowerment and the motivation and the drive is now above the fear. So the fear is nothing to them. Can I jump in for a Sure. Um, it, 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 you are 100% dead on. The, the issue and the reason women are driving this revolution, um, their bodies have been taken hostage by this government. The imposition of a hijab on women is a way that the Islamic Republic nullifies their existence, uses their bodies as a billboard to to demonstrate to the world its own power and its own hegemony over this land, and the fact that they so carelessly kill children should be a crazy-making indication to all of you 
as to the respect they actually have for women. They believe that these women are so much theirs to do with as they wish, that the fruit of their loin is entirely disposable for the sake of their survival. This is the kind of beast Iranians are faced with. This is the kind of animal they're trying to fight off. And we may get to this later, but I just want to say, I think the most brilliant thing that has happened in the last 79 days is that the whole world is finally starting to see that there's a huge difference between the people of Iran and the Islamic Republic that is ruling over them. I hear you, and I also want to say that the line that always gets me in the Baraya song is for the, for the girl who always wishes she was a boy. You know, and I, and, I, and I think a lot about who I am in my life and my identity and how I don't know where I would be if we were still, if we were still there. But um, the next question was actually back to you, Elika. I mean, the question was really, and, and, and I'm going to open it up after to all of you, is there's been a bunch of protests since 1979. We heard of the Green, I mean, we heard of a few right now that were mentioned. I mean, what makes this protest really different? I think the one defining thing that's different to all previous protests is that for the first time we have this age of information we have the ability to share like we've never been able to share before and um the one thing that this revolution is relying on um to continue mobilizing people in the streets and galvanizing people in the streets is the ability to share exactly what's going on so Historically, the regime has silenced the country and it's been successful in doing so because we haven't had that type of access to information, right? So you don't know what's going on. They keep, everything they do is clandestine. It's kept in the dark. So um, it's easy for the international community to look away when, you're on, when you aren't able to access reliable resources as to what's going on. But now with the age of information, technology, mobile phones, you know, we are... They are sending messages out of Iran, even with the internet being shut off. They're connecting through VPN and they're telling us exactly what's going on. And us using our platforms are, you know, being their voice, as they say. Um, and we're able to get the message out there. So as much as the regime has, you know, um, exploited this tactic for the past 43 years, this tactic of silence, which has been so fruitful, so productive, so successful up until now, but in this age of technology, Technology is the cancer to the regime. Mm -hmm. So this, this is why we say this is different because they can't do this to, any, to us anymore. They can't hide anymore. And now with, with our platforms, with the diaspora, even with what we, you know, we're going out there into the media, the regime can't hide anymore. And, and because exposure is their kryptonite, this is their downfall. I'm going to add to that. Um, I think it is not lost on me that this has all happened after the pandemic, where we were home for two years and really recalibrating our equilibrium around what matters. And I think we all came to task around Black Lives Matter. We all did. Everyone used social media platform. Everyone had a conversation. Everyone looked at their workplace. Everyone looked at themselves. You know, we all came to task when it came to holding celebrities accountable who are anti-Semitic. And how do we handle their corporate responsibility with brands? And so this muscle that we've developed over the past few years, yeah. this feeling like, hey, we want to be in a world that we're proud of, but we're going to hold people accountable. And I think because everyone spent two years at home with their social media, getting good at being good at content, growing their followers, we're like, you know what? We're going to cancel the Islamic Republic. What about that? Amen, 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 amen. I love it. There is also a third way in which this revolution is very different. Um, the brief history that I gave you at the very beginning, what I forgot to mention is that much of the discourse around Iran's modernity was about the veiling of women and the bringing of women into society because Iranian men felt very embarrassed. Well, there's actually a queer issue. Westerners were calling Iranian men degenerate homosexuals across the board. So Iranian men were very embarrassed by this fact and they're like, well, you know, maybe if we unveil our women and let them come outside to the street like all, like Western women that, you know, men will stop sleeping with 
boys and this will change everything. So the issue of veiling women and unveiling women has been part of Iran's encounter with modernity for 170 years. There have been two revolutions around this issue and the reason this one is different is because for the first time in 170 years, and I thank God for giving me the privilege of being alive to see this, we are seeing not only the first revolution led by women anywhere in human history, but the women of Iran are standing up and saying, okay, y'all have been trying to tell us what to do for 170 years and you can't figure it out and we're tired of listening to you. This is a revolution against not just the Islamic Republic, this is a revolution against male patriarchal hegemony yes. that has been telling... Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Yes to that. That has been using women as an object with which to measure its own strength and to show its own strength to the outside world. And because of this, I believe from a Jungian perspective, collective unconscious, everything, we could talk about it later, but I really believe this is, I'm convinced that this revolution is not going to stop until it succeeds because it is finally the female element that's coming in on a collective unconscious level that is going to make a huge difference and finally bring balance to a society that's been so desperately missing it for hundreds of years. Yes. Just to add a point to that, because that's so, so on point, um, you know, obviously we got the news this morning about how they're dis disbanding the morality police, which we, we know is not true. Um, but what's interesting about that is that obviously morality police are responsible for enforcing the mandatory hijab, but they didn't, they didn't take away the law that a woman has to wear the hijab, right? So it's like, the question is like, well, why didn't you do that if you're going to disband the morality police? And the reason that they're not going to do that is because any type of empowerment to women or freedom for women is corrosive to their ideology, right? For, in order for their ideology to, to survive, for its sustainability, it must consistently enforce a gender apartheid because in a gender apartheid state, um, the, the, the collective consciousness, the collective psychology of the state is that a woman is subservient. And as long as a woman is subservient, there is no, you know, mental um, desire for uprising, right? So it's this, it's this constant, you know, we, we have to keep you down because if you come up, it's over for us. I can't help it but to share. The, the, my favorite, my, my big fat Greek wedding where they say, it's, isn't it a mistake to educate women? I mean, here we go, you know? Zan zendigi azadi, women, life, freedom. Biggest mistake. But Don't like give us society, power. The 80% of the women there are educated. Yeah. Right? Watch so out. this is why this is happening. Watch because they're out. like, we won't be silenced. We're willing to die over it. We're, and we're willing to do it on camera. Yeah. That is the part that is shocking us, totally. I think, to our bones. We wake up and we're watching them get shot in the face, shot in the eyes, beaten, coming out drugged. Targeted for their beauty, you know? Openly talking about the fact that they've totally. been raped, you know? Yeah, uh, asking for abortion pills. Asking, and so it's, it's the, it's the, it's this, it's like this intense level of, you call it animalistic, I think. Yeah. I, I sometimes think of Iranians here as like domesticated Iranians. <laughs> and like, Iran, I'm like, I look at them and I'm like, wow, like, <laughs> we're like really, like, I'm Shamu and you're like really out there in the wild. Like, you guys are in the streets on this. Like, you are not going to go fearless. down. You're not going to stop. And yeah. you're going to make the whole world watch it. They make me proud. And, and, and it makes me want to they do everything I can all day long for them. They make me proud. Because I'm just clear totally. that I'm totally domesticated. Totally. I'm going to use that one from now on. Domestic. Whenever I introduce myself, I'm going to be like, I'm Iranian, but don't worry, I'm Shamu. <laughs> Like, but do you not think that? Like, you literally, like, you're like, they're just on a next level. They are next level doing things in a way, like, putting buckets on their head, running out with broomsticks, yeah. throwing nails into motorcycles. And I've never seen so many young women running up to armed guards with military-style equipment and just slapping them in the face. And that is just something that 
demands of us here with totally. all of our privilege, power, af access, influence to do something for these totally. people and because it will be yeah. on our conscience if they die. And I think it goes back to what Elika was saying about them being fearless. I mean, when you, when you have a people that's never had a chance to live, they're not, they're, they're alive, but they're not living. And so they have nothing to lose when they, when they can't really do anything outside of their confines. But I, I, I wanna reel us back in and ask Mosh, why do you think we aren't hearing more from mainstream news sources? Like, why, why aren't people following it as much as they should? Help us understand. So there's internal bias of the Islamic Republic and the, the horrendous <coughs> level of threats they've lobbied globally uh, against the US, against, uh, against everybody, right? Um, but specifically the West in countries that, that are freedom-based and democracy-based. Um, it's also very difficult to, there's no journalists on the ground that can validate reports. Um, while some of that doesn't matter here in the West when they're running news, you know, we've, we've seen over the past five or six years that, you know, having valid sources isn't always important, but for some reason when it comes to the Islamic Republic, all of the Western media feels that they can't really cover it without sources on the ground. And so, You've got organizations um, that have made their bread and butter spreading bad information or, or advocating on behalf of the Islamic Republic. Uh, we know of these organizations have been highly funded by the Islam Islamic Republic. So I think you've got a lot of political agendas, you've got lack of resources on the ground, um, and I think that you've got internal bias around what happened 43 years ago and bias of what happens every day. They, they are actively always um, funding war uh, whether it's Hezbollah or Syria or wherever, the Islamic Republic are just bad actors. So I think people are terrified to cover them because they're just not sure how to move. Like every U.S. official is like, we may do the nuclear deal, we may not, we're not sure. It's pretty much a dead, but maybe not fully dead. Like you're hearing everyone from Secretary of State to you know former Secretaries of State just having a difficult time figuring out how to stand up and say, we're going to, no one wants to say like, we're going to take these guys out and we're going to make a plan and we're not telling you until it's done, but we're going to push them out. So you know something more than I do. Tell me. I, I, I don't. <laughs> I Tell don't. us. Um, but I, I suspect that another element, and, and in fact, I may actually be giving more credit to the Western media than they deserve, um, is that there is on some level, certainly in my mind with respect to governments and the government of the United States in particular, I think there is a um, hangover shame from the 1951 coup in Iran that overthrew Mossadegh. I think that at this point, Western diplomats all have all woken up to the fact that this mess is a mess that they created by themselves, for themselves, and for the world just because of their greed for oil. And they are very, very hesitant to go back into Iran because what they thought was a very surgical, need, perfectly slam dunk operation ended up making a mess of everything, so they no longer really know what to do. And during the 1951, um, coup, the American media was very much brought into the entire story and they were constantly talking about what an evil, kami Mossadegh was. They even referred to him as Mossi, many of you may remember. So they had created this evil person of a person who was actually a wonderful Democrat and a brilliant politician especially for Iran, and I, I think people don't really know, like they're just a little gun shy. I don't think that they want to make the same mistake twice. So I have a third thing to add to that. So I think one of the regime's um, most powerful tactics historically is cyber war. And what they do with their cyber war is that they have been you know, parroting the same propaganda for the past 43 years, which is that nothing is going on here. It's just a lie invented by the USA and Israel, right? 
And so I think one of the main problems with Western journalism is that it looks to Iran through a Western construct. So it's looking at Iran. The way that a democratic framework works is that when you're reporting on something, you look to official designations. You look to, uh, you know, the government's official response to something. And this is, you know, they're not understanding that you don't have that level of transparency in Iran because we're talking about a, a terrorist, tyrannical dictatorship. So one thing that the Islamic Republic does to ensure a lack of transparency is that it holds the truth hostage. It conflates the truth. You know, every everything that comes out of the Islamic Republic, whether it's a death sentence, is, you know... Um, is there's, there's a convoluted uh, change of the narrative. Oh, it wasn't because he did this. It's because he smuggled something out of there. And then you don't know whether to trust the family. You don't know whether to trust the government. And so you have this situation where there's kind of like, uh, it's like a paralytic, like the Western, Western journalists are just like, well, nothing has been confirmed. Nothing is official. And it's like, you're not understanding them making it not confirmed. They're making it not official so that you don't report it, you're literally your putty in the hands yeah. of a regime that is trying to hide and you are hiding them for them. Okay, I just, I just got wind that we really got to move through the next few questions. So unless everyone wants to really comment in, let's, let's, let's move a, uh, a little bit um, through. Elika, I want to ask you what, you know, you've been posting a lot on social media. Tell us what the significance of that is and um, and maybe if you can, at some point, get into this misinformation and... and, and mm -hmm. um... So in 20, 2010, 20, was it 2020? Yeah, I think it was 2020. There were uh, three young boys who were protesting the gas prices in Iran and they received the death sentence. And uh, this, for some reason, gained a lot of attention in the international media. There was a lot of outrage. And because of this international attention and because these boys had become famous through the media, their death sentences were eventually commuted and they received a life sentence, which was eventually reduced again to five years. So when this revolution began, it's like something went off in my brain that I'm like, something happened back then. Something happened back then where these boys were looking at death and then the international community was alarmed and the Islamic Republic backed off. So I thought, okay, looks like there's a theme here. Looks like there's a theme where they aren't going to kill people whose names are known to the international community. Obviously, we were all kind of picking up on this. And so by this time, I had kind of built a platform for myself. And I was like, what if we try this for everybody who's high risk? What if we try this for people whose lives are at risk? What if we try this for people who are running the risk of execution? So then, you know, it started this campaign of say their names to save their lives. And it's interesting because um, there was this leaked audio, which we, we can't confirm the validity of, but there was a leaked audio where uh, Khamenei had said that um, you know, they had detained um, Hossein Ronaghi and they said that they didn't want him to die in custody because it would, um, you know, inspire more outrage, which kind of confirmed our hypothesis that they don't want to kill people who are known to the international community because they don't want to regalvanize more protests and more outrage, right? So I, along with everyone else, started using my platform to, uh, you know, speak speak on these stories of people who are facing execution, say their names to save their lives. This is who he is. This is who she is. This is what she's experiencing. If you make this person famous, the regime is not going to kill them because they don't want to do that to themselves, right? And so far, you know, touch wood, so far it's been working. Um, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> Well, you and maybe also Moj, tell me a little bit about how you're combating misinformation, um, you know, that's happening. Yeah, I mean, um, so the misinformation just goes back to what I was talking about, how the regime's common tactic is to put propaganda out there in order to skew the narrative, because this is like one, one of the things that when you... Um, you know, confuse people. When you confuse people by pu putting out multiple truths and nobody knows what the truth is, this induces apathy because people get scared because they don't want to say the wrong thing and then they're shamed and then they're like, okay, let me just say nothing. So their goal is to confuse people into apathy. So they, you know, offer a counter narrative about what's really going on. 
And that gets bought into by people who have no idea what they're talking about, extreme left-wing communists specifically, who parrot the regime propaganda. And then the media and, you know, the general public don't know what to believe anymore. And that's that's how the, the regime wins, right? So our focus as the diaspora has been to just constantly, rigorously combat the misinformation because we know that's our downfall. That's the end of the re revolution when they win, win the media war. And that's just one thing we're not going to let happen. So... We launched um, the Iranian Diaspora Collective, which is an accidental group that was created about three months ago now. We launched a huge billboard strategy, the now famous sort of Times Square Mass Amini uh, billboard campaign, and we took out 136 locations. Woo! <clears throat> We did this so that we could drive awareness. And in addition to that, we did things, we tried to scale influence. We basically brought together about 90 of us into a group. We created something called How to Talk About Iran. It's an open source living document where any and all journalists can go and download the daily facts, trends, data, who to follow, uh, what are the stories they can source within Iran. And we started connecting them with sources on the ground in Iran. Uh, we started to create digital assets because we realized, okay, we're each one doing that, but being an entrepreneur, being a venture capitalist, how can we scale this revolution? So our entire agenda has been to commercialize and scale this revolution, to take the collective and make it as large as possible, whether it's five, you know, five followers or five million followers, to make sure every, day, every single one of us woke up this morning and said, this is fake news, here's the real news. They're spinning the story because there's strikes going on in, this week in Iran. They are going to be three days of general strikes and this is the news they don't want covered. And so I think organizing content from a digital media perspective, uh, they want to give propaganda, we're going to give the correct propaganda right back to them. We're equipped, we're connected, we're resourced, we're raising money, and I think they really, really, really messed with the wrong diaspora. <laughs> like, really messed with yes. the wrong diaspora. And the wrong this generation. This is not any other diaspora. It's like the Iranian Diaspora Collective. Yeah. Come at us, because I really don't think they're going to enjoy how this turns out for them. Okay, let's keep moving, because... Um as Rabbi Farkas said, we have gringos in the room, so uh, we got we to end on a, on a yucky time, on, a, on real time. Um, so I want to skip to this question because I think it's really important. I, you know, at Shabbat dinner, I, I always felt like there was a division um, between my grandparents and my, you know, great uncles and aunts who sort of witnessed the revolution transpire in real time and, and people like my parents and their generation who happened to be in America for college. And so for them, there was always like, you know, I take a bite of a watermelon, they'd, I'd be like, this is delicious. And they'd be like, this is nothing. Hendune Iran, like wait till you taste the, the watermelon of Iran, like that's real, you know? And, and then everyone else at the table would be like, we're never going back. You're like, you don't even want to go visit? No. Nah. Why would we go back? So there's this division, I think, between um, the generations. And not only is there a division, I just feel like when I'm walking around being like, yes, Gen Z, you know, women in Iran, go get it. Everyone else is, what a waste of life. What a waste of life. Like, you know, this is not going anywhere. So I kind of want to see if you can all sort of respond to that in your own way, you know. Why do you think that is? Maybe that's one. And then we'll get into, you know, where do you think this revolution might be headed? I think that we'll end with that. So why, why do you think there is this disparity between the generations of, of uh, you know, of what I kind of brought to the table? From my perspective, I would say that um, you're talking peop to people who've lived it. And to people who've lived it, they have seen things that are beyond our wildest dreams. I mean, we talk about it here, right? And we advocate for it as much as we can. But when you see these types of traumas in real life and when you experience those types of traumas, it's almost so, it's so harrowing and it's so real that to even contemplate something could be bigger than this, you know, seismic, unfathomable level of just terrorism, it's hard to imagine that that's possible, but I think when you talk about Gen Z, when you're talking about people who have, you know, all, the, all, this, all this power and inspiration behind them, they don't see it that way. They see it as, like, nothing is bigger than us, you know?
I think on one level, it may be just a classical generational divide thing, right? When the hippies were running around here, their grandparents were also thinking that these people are crazy, but they changed the world. Um, but I also think that the new generation of Iranians is educated in a way that their parents and grandparents were not. Uh, and, I, you know, I, as a scholar of Iranian culture, I've, I've kind of spent a tremendous amount of time reading the, the, the texts of the so-called intellectuals of the golden years of Iran. And honestly, if I were a TA in college, I would have failed half of these people who, you know, are still carried up on pedestals as the greatest thinkers of the era. Um, so I don't know. I think maybe the older generation is just a little jaded and they fail to realize the importance of this. And, and, and I think if you're not on social media, you're also missing the power of the impact of how this revolution is being televised and how this revolution is actually moving forward. I think the trauma is deep and real within this community. I think it is very painful for Iranians to relive this experience. I find it strange that I'm closer to my mom right now than I have been maybe my entire life. She has cried more, she has been more open, she has been more vulnerable. And I think that a lot of us say we don't want something when the concept of wanting it so bad and it might not happen, like that you may not have that watermelon is so painful for them yeah. that they would rather say, I don't want it. But I don't know anyone at all who is Iranian, who has been to Iran, that would not love to go back in a condition that was welcoming and true and authentic to who Iranian people really are. I think that it is painful, painful, painful for the majority of Iranians who are not watching this content all day long because the heartbreak of this revolution just sinking back and away, fading away, is just too deep and too hard because they have lost their schools, their school friends they went to school with, where they grew up, the playgrounds they went to, all of their neighborhoods, their friends, the places they vacation. Like, imagine you go away to go to school and come back and all of a sudden, like my parents did not see their family for 15 years, their own parents, their siblings, you're stuck. The na names of the streets have changed, the names of the schools have changed. Like that is a terrifying experience and I think that um, they're damaged by trauma and that is like a really intense trauma that is not known a name until now. Truth. I guess, I'll, I guess I'll morph one of our final questions together, which is, um, what can we do? I mean, if you look at the audience right now, I mean, what, what is there that we can do to, to either put pressure on, on politicians or our news anchors or what, what, what could we do? Is it more sanctions? Is it militia? We need, we need to, you know, to declare war. Like, what is it that, that we can do from each of your angles, I mean, I mean, looking, you know, your final sort of message on, on this to, to the people. What can they do? I'll start first. <clears throat> first, I think events like this are really, really, really important. I think, I think everyone coming together to discuss this is extremely important. Look, I, I pitch this to people on all types of angles. I think a democratic, secular Iran is good business for the world. It is good opportunity. I think there are 8% of the natural resources of the world in this country. And I think there is a huge amount of intellectual capital inside the walls of Evian prison and inside Iran. And I think a secular Iran is a safe, stable Middle East. And that is good for all of us. We do not want Russia in business with Iran. We do not need an emboldened nuclear armed Iran. Yes, we don't need that. So that's my business pitch. On a human pitch, it is a scar on humanity to allow this tragedy to continue to go on, especially because it's young women, especially because it's young girls. And I really think that every single person with a resources, financial, or platform, or company, we've partnered with everyone from 
Bumble to publicists to we're going to start working with. Yes, because it is a women's rights issue. And if you care about women's rights, you have to care about the Iranian people. You must. It is non-negotiable. As much as you hate the Islamic Republic, we also hate the Islamic Republic. I think one of the most important things is for people to really genuinely, truly understand that when we tell you there's a difference between the Islamic Republic and the people of Iran, that we mean it. This is a hostage nation. Our country has been taken over by a handful of terrorist clergymen who are most of whom really honestly don't have a seventh grade education. Truly, most of them do not have a seventh grade education. So that's one of the most important messages. The other one, I believe, is to get the Western world to cut ties with Iran. There, we're, we're, you know, an event funded by the Jewish Federation. I'm sure there's doctors in the audience. Um, any oncologist will tell you that there's many ways to get rid of, can to, to battle cancer. And really, the, the golden goose of battling cancer is to find a way to cut off the blood supply from the cancer without destroying the rest of the body. Well, if you cut off the blood supply from the Islamic Re Republic, trust that the people of Iran themselves will handle the rest of the matter. Just stop sending money to these people to stop giving them an incentive to remain in power to fatten their pockets. These are the two things that will make a huge difference, I believe. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, you know, social media is so important during this time, and this is exactly why I mentioned earlier that it's so different to last time. You know, right now they're fighting the revolution physically in Iran, and they are relying on us in the diaspora to use social media to be their voice and to bring awareness to everything that is happening in Iran. So we are working symbiotically with each other to keep this revolution alive. And people don't believe how much of a difference it makes when you just talk about these people, when you say their names, you're literally saving their lives. And the last thing I'll say about that is that, um, you know, there's this quote by Gil Scott Heron, and the quote is, the revolution will not be televised. And this quote is so often misunderstood. People believe that that quote means that literally, the revolution will not have any media, it won't be on TV, but that's not at all what he meant when he said that. What he meant when he said that is that the revolution is in the mind, right? So this revolution right now, the reason, the reason why it's so different is because we have, they have started planting the seeds of this revolution to alter the landscape of how we understand, you know, human rights in the Middle East, what's happening in the me Middle East, what future, you know, we envision for posterity in the Middle East. And so, so much of what we're doing with these dialogues is that we're planting the seed of the mental, psychological revolution that with that alone, with that alone, with our new understanding of, of how we want our world to look like, inspires us to go out and forge that world, right? And so just talking about it, just understanding about it, just this new way of thinking about it is planting the seeds for the revolution. And that's the thing that's not being televised, but that's bigger than everything. I'm going to end with this line, this beautiful line Alika just told us, which is the revolution is in our mind. I think the number one thing that we can do is not just put it in our mind, but post it out there. We all have different people that follow us, especially if we're rabbis in the community or figure leaders. And the whole idea is that the more you post, the people that are outside of your social purview will, will see it and will repost it and will help amplify the voices of the Iranian people because out of it, look at what's come. We've had a local event here in LA. We have an Iranian diaspora collective that's created, that's helping the internet that's being shut down and the electricity that's being shut down in Iran, fixing that, helping fix that, helping mitigate that. And so there's so much that you can do just by posting. We're living in a day and age where all you have to do is click. 
And the whole world, people that you didn't know are following. Don't think people know what's going on. People have asked me a few weeks ago who Masa Amini is. There are a lot of people in this world that don't know. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go to all of our questions, but I am definitely, definitely going to email more information our, about our panelists so they can watch them and follow them and read their books. Um, also, just a quick plug, Dr. Akimi is in the room. We are having a live event with Masi Ali Najad with PAWC. I'm also having a virtual event with Masi Ali Najad in a couple of weeks. I hope you all can join us. I want to give us a final round of applause to our fantastic panelists. Thank you all for joining. Yes, please let's stand.